thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're trying this with a projector on. We hope that indeed it will work. Ecology of Early Food Production in Mesopotamia. Culture History versus Culture Process. Farming Systems and Political Growth in Ancient Oaxaca. Social and Economic Systems in Formative Mesoamerica. Origins and Ecological Effects of Early Domestication in Iran and the Near East. Archaeological Systems Theory in Early Mesoamerica. The Olmec and the Valley of Oaxaca. The Origins of the Village as a Settlement Type in Mesoamerica and the Near East the cultural evolution of civilizations, the origins of agriculture. That's merely the slightest selection, but I hope it suggests to you the, the range and the richness of a speaker who seems to me peculiarly appropriate for the promise and the idea that we are uh, here tonight to help to celebrate. Uh, Kent Flannery, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Bob, after that introduction, I, I really feel an archaeologist should never be without his shovel. <laughs> Some uh, 34 years ago, in 1948 to be exact, the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago began a research project that was to change forever the way archaeologists searched for the origins of agriculture and village life. Called the Iraq Jarmo Project, it was directed by Robert and Linda Braidwood and featured a, a cast of thousands, including archaeologists, botanists, zoologists, and geologists. Now, I, I'm not going to dwell particularly on the immediate results of that project because in a little while you'll be able to see them firsthand in the exhibit that opens today here at the Oriental Institute. What I really want to talk about tonight is the long-term legacy of that project. 34 years of subsequent research based either explicitly or implicitly on the model of the Iraq Jarmo project and spread all over the world from Thailand and Egypt to Mexico and Peru. The reason the Braidwoods work gave rise to so many daughter projects and granddaughter projects and great-granddaughter projects was not because of the artifacts it recovered, but because of the intellectual excitement it produced. And to give you an idea of this, I can do no better than to begin by using the words of the distinguished British prehistorian Seton Lloyd, who in his 1963 book, Mounds of the Near East, uh, said it as follows. This is quoting uh, from Seton Lloyd. In 1945, he says, Braidwood had started to plan a long-term and painstaking investigation of that phase in man's history which the late Gordon Child had called the Neolithic Revolution. By this he meant the transition from the cave-dwelling and food-gathering economy of the Paleolithic period to the cultural level of village farming communities. Much reflection on this subject had created a new focus of interest in what Braidwood described as the hilly flanks of the Fertile Crescent, that is to say, the Piedmont country which swings eastward from Lebanon through the northern fringes of Syria into Iraq. His reason for this choice is perhaps best explained in his own words, in which he said, quote, within this hilly flank zone there occur in nature a remarkable constellation of the very plants and animals which became the basis for the food producing pattern of Western cultural tradition. If I could have the first slide now. Nowhere else in the world were the wild wheats and barley, the wild pigs, cattle, and horses to be found together in a, sing, uh, a single natural environment. Now, I really had to go back into the archives to get this. <laughs> this is the original 1948 crayon sketch uh, that Bob Braidwood made showing the overlap of the ancestors of einkorn wheat, emmer wheat, sheep, and goats uh, in the Near East that laid the groundwork uh, for this project. And uh, let's see, I think I can. And here indeed is uh, a section of the hilly flanks uh, showing you wild wheat growing in among the oak trees 
uh, of the Zagros Mountains. Seton Lloyd goes on to say, it is much to Braidwood's credit that his plan of campaign extended beyond the realm of mere digging to include such subjects as the domestication of plants and animals and all the other environmental influences which helped to bring about the Neolithic Revolution. His expedition then included, uh, in addition to specialists in archaeology and the lithic industries of early times, uh, such people as botanists and zoologists. And what he envisioned, again in his own words, was, quote, not the familiar old-fashioned archaeology of digging royal tombs for fine art museums, but an idea archaeology aimed at broad cultural historical problems in which antiquities as such are meaningless save as tools for understanding uh, the ways of mankind. Uh, at that point, of course, Seton Lloyd cannot resist taking credit for finding the site of Jarmo. Uh, and to quote him, in 1945, Fuad Safar and I had paid a memorable visit to Jarmo on a hot May afternoon, three hours on horseback from the nearest motor road. It had to be, of course, found through great hardship. A tiny Kurdish village far up in the foothills above the town of Chemchamal. Near the village, a shoulder of hillside composed of silt and conglomerate had been cut into and eroded by the flood water of a deep wadi, leaving a cliff about a hundred feet high. That's what you see in this old uh, black and white photo from the archives. And in the brow of this cliff one could see, uh, Lloyd goes on, perfectly delineated, the stratification of a human settlement which must have stood on its summit. Uh, in among the uh, the wheat, we were able to collect a handful of very weathered and nondescript potsherds, but what interested us mo more was that by hanging over the actual cliff edge, one could see the pavement lines marking successive occupations, which seemed to be covered not with pottery, but by a deposit of edible snail shells, among which was a good sprinkling of microlithic flints. And he goes on to say, late in 1948, Braidwood made a jeep road up to Jarmo and set up camp. The sounding which he made led to a full-scale expedition in 1950 and another in 1954. And he did indeed recover what has since been described in his own words as a very early but fully-fledged village farming community. The site contained about a dozen architectural levels, creating a deposit about 20 feet deep. He estimates that the total number of houses in the village at any one time did not exceed 25 and that the population had amounted to no more than 150 people. And he thinks that the lifetime of the village may have been 250 years, with the most reliable carbon-14 date, which he afterwards obtained, giving a reading of approximately 6750 BC. We'll now very briefly see uh, some more photos out of the past. Yeah. Building levels at uh, Jarmo, showing some of the rectangular houses associated with the early village farming community. stone-founded um, houses in the upper levels. And here probably the first, uh, or one of the first slides taken of the uh, Jarmo artifacts, uh, taken so long ago uh, uh, that you will in fact see uh, a date given here which has long since been revised backward. Um, as, uh, as Bob Adams mentioned, in addition to being able to see an exhibit on Jarmo uh, this evening, very soon you're going to be able to read about it because the final report on Jarmo is, is in page proof and just about to come off the press. I have to say as an aside here that when I was a graduate student here in the 1960s, I used to kid Bob Braidwood a lot about how long it was taking to get the Jarmo report out. <laughs> 1948, I used to say, come on, you finished the site eight years, ten years ago, how come it isn't published? Well, Bob was very patient with me. He just smiled and said, Kent, wait till you've got your own project and you're trying to get chapters out of your botanist and your zoologist and your ge uh, geologist, then you'll find out. And he was right. Now I've got my own site in Mexico related to the origins of agriculture. It's been finished for 10 years and it isn't close to being published yet. So I've completely changed my philosophy now. I now believe that all archeologists should follow the lead of that great California winemaker, Paul Masson, 
who said it best over a hundred years ago, I will publish no site before it's time. <laughs> All right, all right. B before I move on to now to some of the uh, spin-offs of the JARMO project, I want to call special attention to three aspects of the Braidwoods uh, projects that have now been applied elsewhere, and we're going to see these three uh, things applied in many different parts of the world. There are only three out of many that I could have uh, picked. What you see here is the impression of a spikelet of emmer wheat in a fragment of clay floor from the site of Jarmo. On that project, it was discovered that some of the best evidence for the uh, beginnings of agriculture lay in impressions in clay floors, clay walls, and even in potsherds of uh, fragments of wheat and barley that had been included, included uh, mixed with the mud, uh, either when pottery was being made or when mud floors were being made. I want you to remember this slide because you will see this very technique used in Thailand and in Ecuador later in this talk to document uh, early agriculture. Now, another of the techniques I'll talk about uh, actually uh, came on a project in Turkey, uh, which uh, was a spin-off from the work at Jarmo, uh, and this was the Braidwoods project at Chayanu, in the course of which, um, a botanist, Jack Harlan, who is here with us tonight, undertook a harvest of wild wheat in an effort to find out uh, what the productivity of the wild ancestor of the cultivated cereal was. Um, and what you see here is a field of einkorn wheat in Turkey near the site of Chayanu. What Harlan did um, first was to uh, begin field stripping um, with his hands uh, uh, harvesting in an area that he estimated might yield as much as uh, 500 or 800 kilograms of uh, wheat per hectare. And um, uh, after five separate periods of hand stripping the wild wheat heads from their stalks, he found he was collecting an average of just over tilo two kilograms of grain per hour. This is a kind of harvest that is still practiced by the Bedouin of southern Jordan. But as he discovered, it takes tougher hands than the average university professor has. So uh, he then switched to harvesting by means of a prehistoric sickle, which you see in this uh, slide, made of flint blades from Jarmo, set in a wooden handle. And this then enabled him to um, harvest nearly two and a half kilograms per hour with much less wear and tear on his hands. In the end, Harlan concluded that a family of four, harvesting for the whole of the three-week period during which the einkorn was ripe, could e easily harvest a metric ton, which would be a year's supply. I want you to remember this particular uh, contribution of the Braidwoods projects because you'll see a similar technique applied uh, in Mexico uh, to a different cereal a little later. And then the third uh, of the techniques, uh, has to do with the study of changes in animal sizes and in the age and sex profiles of populations of animals in archaeological sites. I begin with this uh, slide because it documents one of archaeology's most romantic moments. Uh, Charles Reed and myself extracting the skeleton of a wild boar that had been dead for 11 days. <laughs> it, it was very cold that day. But for reasons we still don't fully understand, uh, Linda made us do it outside. <laughs> now, the skeletons extracted from such animals allowed us to uh, make comparisons of wild and domestic races of animals to look for genetic osteological evidence for domestication. What you see here is, on the left, uh, the mandible of a wild pig, possibly even the one you saw in the previous slide, and on the right, an enlarged photograph of some uh, cheek teeth of the domestic races. And uh, uh, as, it, as it turns out, there is a considerable size decrease following domestication uh, that these uh, skeletal remains document. I want you to remember this slide, too, because you will see the same technique applied to the Andean camelids, the llama and alpaca, when we get to uh, Peru. All right, what were some of the immediate spin-offs 
of the project at Jarmo? Well, some of the sites um, shown on this map, uh, which shows uh, the border area between Iraq and Iran. Up near the top, you will see the site of Sarab in the Kermanshah Valley of Iran, excavated uh, by uh, uh, the Braidwoods, uh, Bruce Howe, uh, Frank Hull, Patty Joe Watson, Red Watson, uh, many of the people who are here tonight uh, during the period 1959-1960. And this, uh, the site of Sarab has since been written up as a doctoral dissertation by Mary MacDonald for the University of Toronto. Uh, also on the map, a little to the south of Sarab, you'll see Tepe Guron in the Hulilan Valley, excavated by Peter Mortensen at that time of the National Museum in, in Denmark in the early 1960s. Uh, and um, unfortunately not on this map because uh, the map was made so long ago. Uh, the site of Ganj Dare, excavated by Phil Smith and Kyler Young, uh, who are also here tonight in the late 1960s. And then um, farther to the south in the Piedmont area, uh, the site of Ali Kosh, which Frank Hole and I excavated. That one is a direct spin-off of the work at Sarab because the site was found by Richard Watson in 1959 during the course of the of the uh, project in Kermanshah, and then uh, excavated in 1961 and 1963. We'll just briefly go through some of these. Here you see uh, uh, the site of uh, Sarab being excavated uh, in 1960. Uh, I wanted to show you this uh, old picture from the archives. In the lower foreground, you see Frank Hole as a teenager uh, investigating the stratigraphy of Sarab. Um, and you then see Frank reappear at Ali Kosh some years later. This is a picture taken in 1963. Um, you could see at that time Frank was working for a university in Texas. <laughs> I remember in that field season his typical greeting was, Salam Alekum, y'all. <laughs> the, the earliest levels at Ali Kosh had rectangular houses like Jarmo. Uh, but they were built of very small mud bricks, like those you see in cross-section here. Um, another of the techniques used on the project uh, was the result of work at the University of Chicago. The technique of floating uh, ash deposits in water in order to extract the carbonized seeds was pioneered by Stuart Strever, uh, who was at that time one of our fellow graduate students at the University of Chicago in the early 1960s, now a professor uh, at Northwestern University. And here are some of the carbonized seeds uh, and uh, grain spikelets that came out of those flotation samples. Another of the uh, techniques that we applied was uh, the uh, criteria for uh, goat domestication that had been worked out by Charles Reed, a uh, zoologist working on uh, Braidwood's projects in that period. Uh, and what you see here is a sequence of changes in the horn core of the goat. Um, on the left, the typical horn of the uh, wild goat, or a phenotypically wild goat with its lozenge-shaped um, cross-section. In the middle, the kind of medially flattened cross-section that you get with the early domestic goats from 6500 or 7000 BC. And then over on the right, the medially concave cross-section of the now corkscrew-twisted or helically-twisted goat horn core, uh, which you get uh, after 6000 BC. This is just uh, the sequence of changes in horn cores at the site of Ali Kosh. Uh, in addition, uh, it, it proved possible to work out what zoologists call survivorship curves by uh, calculating the percentage of goats that were alive at the end of half a year, a year, a year and a half, two years, and so on. What you see in this uh, slide is the profile of a wild goat population up at the top uh, where it says Upper Paleolithic, and then compared with that are three profiles of early domestic herds, which show that uh, very few goats, uh, perhaps uh, 30 or 35 percent, are left alive at the end of three and a half years. And uh, once again, this is this technique of searching for evidence of domestication in the changing uh, age profile of a herd has now been applied to uh, the beginnings of camelid domestication in the Peruvian Andes.
All through the 1960s, field work stimulated by the original project at Jarmo continued all over the area of the Fertile Crescent. And uh, this slide uh, from uh, one of Jack Harlan's articles uh, shows some of the sites, of which I can only uh, show you a few. One of the things that developed during this period was that there was um, a, a still earlier period earlier than Jarmo, uh, probably going back uh, to the neighborhood of 8,000 or perhaps even 9,000 years BC, uh, a period which uh, Braidwood has referred to as one of incipient agriculture, where it's really very difficult to tell whether the plants and animals are uh, domestic yet. Uh, one of the sites of that time period was the site of Asiab, which you see being excavated here, uh, perhaps only a mile from uh, Sarab, and excavated by Bruce Howe in 1960. I want you to note that the archaeologists here are standing in part of what appears to be a circular semi-subterranean house. And um, as you'll see as we go through um, the not only the Near East, but Egypt and many other parts of the world, it is frequently the case that the period of incipient agriculture uh, is uh, characterized by uh, settlements with uh, circular semi-subterranean houses, whether you're talking about Peru, Egypt, the Levant, and so on. Here, for example, uh, we have the site of Ein Malaha near Lake Hule in Israel, with uh, Jean Perrault kindly serving as scale for uh, a, a circular uh, semi-subterranean house. Um, this is a site in the heartland area of wild emmer wheat. And here are some of the, here's a plan of some of the circular semi-subterranean houses. Uh, here is Jean uh, serving as scale at the site of Nahal Oren uh, near Mount Carmel in Israel, uh, a site excavated by Moishe Stekelis in the 1960s and more recently by Cambridge University. In the original Stekelis excavation, once again, uh, circular uh, huts with uh, stone foundations were found. And then more recently, a Cambridge University project um, uh, directed by Anthony Legg found apparently carbonized grains of what is believed to be emmer wheat under a huge rock in the back of the ca this cave, which overlooks those terraces at Nahaloren. The associated materian material is kabaran, or late Upper Paleolithic, and according to Ofer Bar Yosef, there are two radiocarbon dates thought to be associated, and I would underline thought to be associated, with the uh, grains from the back of this cave one of 14,300 B.C. and another of 13,800 B.C. Uh, if that holds up, certainly uh, the oldest radiocarbon dates associated with a carbonized um, wheat or barley in the Near East. These carbon-14 dates are interesting in the light of some new claims now being made for the antiquity of cereals in the Nile Valley. And uh, here we will move now uh, to the Nile Valley. Uh, the three areas that I want you to keep your eye on uh, here on this map are the Fayum Depression uh, up near the north, uh, Baderi farther to the south, uh, and then about two-thirds of the way down the slide near Aswan, you'll see a site simply marked uh, Kubania, which we'll see a slide of in a moment. Until recently, the oldest evidence for agriculture in Egypt was relatively recent compared to uh, the Fertile Crescent. Such projects, for example, as Gertrude Caton Thompson's excavations between 1924 and 1928 in the Fayum Depression had revealed Neolithic peoples living in simple huts, growing emmer wheat and barley, which they kept in underground granaries, uh, perhaps sometime around 5000 BC. And here are, uh, here are some of the specimens of wheat and barley from those old uh, excavations in the Fayum. This is another photo from the archives. These people also lived in circular huts, uh, like these uh, pre-dynastic huts from a site called North Spur Hemimia, which was excavated by Caton Thompson in the 1920s and dating probably to somewhere between 4,000 and 4,500 BC. More recently, however, Fred Windorf of Southern Methodist University has excavated the site you saw on the map, a Wadi Kubania, on the Upper Nile, for which he has now announced radiocarbon dates of between 16,300 BC and 15,000 BC. The site has apparently produced carbonized barley, 
emmer wheat, lentils, chickpeas, capers, and dates. And it's clear that Wendorf's work uh, is stimulated by that of the Braidwoods because in his reports he makes uh, constant reference to their earlier work. Here is um, a diagrammatic section of the stratigraphy at Wadi Kubaniya, uh, showing there has been a tremendous amount of deflation and erosion at the site. Uh, it's an extremely complicated profile. Um, as uh, as uh, one of Wendorf's critics once said, uh, would you buy a used car from a site with a profile like this? <laughs> oh. Now, these radiocarbon dates of Wendorf's would be uh, mind-bogglingly early were it not for the possible radiocarbon dates of 13,000 and 14,000 BC uh, for the emmer wheat from uh, Nahal Um I am certainly not going to settle any controversy about whether th uh, this is in fact um, uh, the oldest evidence for agriculture in the world. Um, one of the nice things about archaeology is that uh, future work will certainly uh, clarify this. Um, either future work will discover more sites of the same age with confirming radiocarbon dates and more evidence uh, for early agriculture, or else it will overthrow it. We only have to wait uh, patiently and see what happens. All I would point out is that this uh, stretch of the Nile uh, does not have in it the wild ancestors uh, of most of the plants uh, which have been found at Wadi Kubaniya. So if, in fact, it turns out agriculture began in the upper Nile at 15,000 BC, it simply implies that somewhere else where the wild ancestors of these plants live, uh, still at a still earlier uh, date, uh, agriculture had begun. Now here is some of the uh, barley from uh, Wadi Kubaniya. All right, before we leave the old world and go on to the new, uh, I just want to briefly talk about Southeast Asia, which you see here in this slide. Now, Southeast Asia is an area of root crops, things like yam and taro, none of which have been preserved in archaeological deposits of any antiquity. Um, and nevertheless, it is tropical Thailand, which has produced the oldest archaeological plant remains from the Far East. This part of the world could also ultimately prove to be the homeland of rice, uh, and it is the origins of rice that is probably the $64,000 question for Southeast Asia because there's no other plant that provides sustenance for as many people as it does. Uh, of the more than 20 species of the genus Oryza, which are distributed through the Old World tropics, um, one wild perennial form Oryza perennis is the likely ancestor of uh, the most important strain of domestic rice. Domestication has changed it to an annual grass, has given it a tough uh, axis, and a larger grain size. And there are specimens of such rice from archaeological deposits of around 3000 BC at Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus River Valley, and of 2500 BC on Formosa but presumably the history of rice must go back uh, farther still. And uh, uh, one of the sites on this map, the site of Nok Nok Ta, has produced evidence for early rice here. But I want to talk first about Spirit Cave, which you see uh, on the upper part of the map. The oldest radiocarbon dated plant remains from Southeast Asia come from Spirit Cave. They were recovered in 1966 by the late uh, archaeologist uh, Chester Gorman and identified uh, by uh, Douglas Yen, an ethnobotanist at the University of Hawaii. The radiocarbon dates associated with them range in age between 6600 and 7200 BC, and the plants themselves have been identified as the almond, butternut, the candle nut, the beetle nut, uh, a, a bean which has not been specifically identified to genus, the bottle gourd, which is one of the oldest domestic plants in several different parts of the world, the water chestnut, uh, the black pepper, and the cucumber. Now, it's, it's a strange list in a sense because there's virtually no staple on it. Um, we might uh, call it uh, a case of incipient condiment domestication. <laughs> uh, most conspicuously absent in the spirit cave remains uh, is rice, and it is knock um, uh, ta. Uh, uh, that uh, sheds uh, light on, uh, on rice. 
uh, project at Nok Nok Ta under the, uh, ultimately under the direction of uh, Wilhelm Solheim, uh, but uh, with the major excavation carried out by Don Bayard, has contributed a major breakthrough here because imprints of cereal grains, including rice, have been identified in potsherds from the site. And here are some of the uh, potsherds from the lower levels of Nok Nok Ta. Once again, the same technique that you saw at Jarmo, where it is the negative impression of the cereal, uh, either in the wall or floor or a potsherd, uh, that has been used as uh, evidence. The radiocarbon dates involved are somewhere between 3000 and 4000 BC. That probably is not the earliest date we're going to get for uh, the domesticated rice, but at the moment, that's where we stand on the origins of rice in uh, Southeast Asia. All right, let me move now uh, to the New World, uh, beginning with Mexico, which is another area that has very early domestication <coughs> and in which the legacy of Jarmo has played uh, an important role. Sometime between the close <coughs> of the Pleistocene period and the start of the uh, 5th millennium BC, the Indians of Mexico first began the cultivation of a whole series of native plants that would later become the staple foods of ancient Mesoamerican civilization. Uh, these people were intensive wild plant collectors who had lived off the land for millennia, learning how to roast uh, the century plant to make it edible, how to make wooden tongs for picking the spiny fruit of the organ cactus off, how to extract syrup from the pod of the mesquite, how to leach tannic acid from acorns, and how to find wild bean and wild onion flowers in the dense underbrush so that they would know where to return at a later time to harvest them. And finally, by 5000 BC, one of their ultimate strategies became the artificial increase of certain edible plants by selection and planting. Beans, squashes, pumpkins, chili peppers, tomatoes, avocados, and perhaps even uh, the prickly pear and uh, agave are a whole series of plants that came under domestication not long after this date. But by far the most important of these plants was maize, or Indian corn which the Indians of this area so modified that in the words of uh, botanist George Beadle, former uh, chancellor of the University of Chicago, the Indians of Mexico can be credited with having produced the greatest morphological change of any cultivated plant uh, compared to its wild ancestor and having adapted it to the widest geographical range of any major crop plant. Now, not so very long ago, <clears throat> the whole period of earliest agriculture in Mesoamerica was hypothetical. Ex it existed uh, only on paper. And then Richard S. McNeish, uh, PhD, University of Chicago, 1948, uh, another student uh, who was influenced by the Braidwood's work in the Near East, began to work on the northern periphery of Mesoamerica, and then eventually, during the years 1960 through 1964, he began to work uh, in uh, the Valley of Tehuacan in the central part of Mexico. During those four years, 90% of what we know about the origins of agriculture in Mexico uh, came to light. And um, uh, I was lucky enough at that time uh, as a graduate student at the University of Chicago, uh, having worked uh, in the Near East with the Braidwoods to be able to work uh, next with McNeish uh, in central Mexico. Now. Um, I will not go into here all the controversies surrounding the ancestry of maize. Since I am on the campus of the University of Chicago, uh, I will uh, follow the theory of George Beadle, former chancellor of the University of Chicago, uh, which is also uh, supported by Jack Harlan, who happens to be here tonight. And I don't know that anyone from the opposing school is here. So uh, <laughs> let's just say that that particular school, uh, school holds that maize or Indian corn is probably descended from the widespread Mexican grass, Teosinte. And what this map shows is the known distribution of Teosinte in Mexico. Teosinte is admittedly uh, the nearest relative to cultivated maize. It has an identical chromosome number. And to the casual observer, it looks so much like maize that almost the only way you can tell the two plants apart is that maize has a cob and teosinte doesn't. It has a spike like the old world cereals. 
it has uh, seven to 12 seeds enclosed in very hard fruit cases and set in sequence on a brittle rachis. And like wild wheat in the Near East, it shatters naturally and is very difficult to harvest efficiently. It is a weedy pioneer plant that likes to colonize natural scars in the landscape. Now, uh, uh, before I show you some of the uh, colonization of natural scars in the landscape, here is how George Beadle reconstructs the ancestry of maize. On the left, you see a spike of teosinte. Uh, you see then a teosinte-like hybrid uh, from a maize population uh, to the right of that. Uh, perhaps the most crucial of the specimens you see here is the one that is third from the left. That is teosinte that has had a single gene introduced, a gene called the tunicate gene, which changes it from having a very hard seed case to one that is more like the soft glooms that you get on corn. Uh, that's the kind of genetic change that Beetle imagines is involved in the origins of maize. And then uh, obviously on the uh, right, you see a primitive uh, example of a corn cob. Now, Here's a shot of a semi-tropical valley in central Mexico uh, to the west of the Valley of Mexico. What I want to call your attention to is that triangular shaped yellow area in the center of the slide. That is a massive stand of teosinte. Uh, some would call it wild teosinte. I think Jack Harlan would probably refer to it as a weed teosinte. It is a kind of teosinte that has invaded abandoned cornfields. And this gives you some idea uh, how densely it grows. When cornfields are abandoned in this area, they are rapidly invaded by teosinte, so much so that at the time this slide was taken, we were able to drive for 30 miles without losing sight of massive stands of teosinte growing up to two meters high. If a group of hunters and gatherers cleared a campsite in this environment, the following year when they returned, they would find a teosinte field growing on their former campsite. Now, one other surprise awaited us as we accompanied George Beadle on a teosinte harvest in this area. Always in the literature we had read that the Indians of Mexico uh, had um, uh, exhibited a stroke of genius when they combined corn, beans, and squash into one uh, uh, triumvirate grown together in the same cornfield and providing the staple uh, for early villages in Mexico. What we decided, what we discovered to our surprise on this teosinte hunt was that, in fact, the Indians hadn't had the idea at all. Nature provided the model. What you see here are wild runner beans twining around a teosinte plant uh, occurring naturally in the wild. And in this next slide, although it's a little hard to see, down in among the, uh, in around the roots of those teosinte plants, you see wild squashes growing. So. Uh, the idea of growing corn beans and squash together in the field uh, was not an idea of the Mexican Indians. It was already provided as a model by nature. All they did was to domesticate all three and move them uh, into the cornfield uh, as a group. In 1971, botanist uh, Richard Ford and I decided to harvest wild teosinte, uh, modeling our efforts on the wild wheat harvest uh, by Jack Harlan in Turkey, which you've already seen. Uh, some uh, photos abo about. And here are, uh, this will give you an idea how densely teosinte grows in parts of Mexico. Our least productive plot, which was on a scree slope which probably approximates natural wild conditions, yielded something like uh, 152 kilograms per hectare or less. Our most productive plot, which was on an abandoned or fallow cornfield, which probably approximates the best conditions you'd get if you were cultivating uh, teosinte, yielded something like uh, 627 kilograms per hectare. Now that is comparable to the yields of the Near Eastern cereals. As a follow-up to this, we took some of the teosinte seeds that we'd harvested and grew them uh, in the Valley of uh, Mexico. Uh, this amounted to taking them out of an area in which they were native and uh, transporting them to a floodplain in a different valley. And here you see uh, one of our graduate students, Robert Drennan, uh, talking to the landowner who volunteered the use of his field for this. Now, um, unfortunately, we picked a year uh, that was a drought year, so we only got a yield of uh, something like um, uh, 80 or 100 kilograms per hectare uh, under better conditions in a better year, we probably would have done better than that. 
But what we learned from this is that it probably wasn't practical to try to grow this stuff everywhere in Mexico until the genetic changes in the direction of maize had raised its productivity to above 250 kilograms per hectare. At that point, uh, it made sense to concentrate on it. And that may help to account for the long time lag between the original domestication uh, in Mexico, uh, about 5,050 B.C., and the appearance of the first primary village farming communities about 1500 BC. It simply took that long uh, and that many genetic changes to make uh, maize productive. All right, let me, <coughs> let me now uh, discuss briefly McNeish's contribution to it. What you see here in this cliff is a cave called Koshgatlan Cave, uh, one of the, probably one of the two or three most important archaeological sites in all of Mexico from a cultural historical uh, standpoint. It was here at this cave between 1960 and 1964 that McNeish found the oldest domestic maze uh, in the world, 5050 BC. Uh, here is uh, McNeish pointing to one domestic plant and smoking another. <laughs> I didn't ask, but I think it was tobacco. <laughs> and here is uh, McNeish's hand holding up for you the oldest known corn. That is a complete cob, only slightly larger than uh, a cigarette filter. And uh, this slide reminds me of a conversation I once had with McNeish during the course of that project, which is relevant to uh, the topic today. McNeish and I were talking about the problems of working with interdisciplinary teams on archaeological problems, and we were wondering out loud why some people, like the Braidwoods, had succeeded at this and other people had, had failed. And McNeish offered this suggestion. The secret, he said, is to have an iron fist in a velvet glove. The iron fist is there to keep your botanist and your zoologist and your geologist working on your research problem rather than wandering off through the Zagros Mountains to places like Zarabar and the Dashti Kavir of central Iran looking for onagers and uh, interesting lakes decor and uh, to keep your botanist working in the same vegetational zone and so on. The velvet glove is there to keep them all happy and make them feel that they're each getting to do what they really wanted to do. <laughs> McNeish's work succeeded because of the iron fist you see in this slide, and, and Braidwood succeeded because he had one too. Okay, let me move from there uh, 160 miles south to the area where I did my own work uh, following McNeish's project. Uh, my own work, which was consciously patterned on that of the Braidwoods and of McNeish, took place in the Valley of Oaxaca in southern Mexico between 1966 and uh, 1980. And here uh, is my Jarmo. Uh, this is the cave uh, of Gila Nakitz, uh, in which we found the bottle gourd domestic between 7,000 and 8,000 BC, Cucurbita pepo, the ancestor of the cultivated squash, domestic by about 8,000 B.C., wild runner beans uh, either being used in the wild or uh, with attempts being made at their domestication between 7,000 and 8,000 B.C., and uh, uh, maize or Indian corn uh, entering the area sometime between 4,000 and 5,000 B.C., about the time uh, that it shows up in Tehuacan. And here on this slide you see on the upper left a tiny black runner bean uh, on the upper right, you see the rinds of an early cultivated cucurbit, and then in the lower row, uh, some primitive corn. What happened is that that primitive corn got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Um, by about 1500 BC, it had reached the size that you see in the middle specimen there, the one third from the left. At that point, its yield would have been something on the order of 250 or 300 kilograms per hectare. And it is at that point that you begin to get the first permanent uh, primary village farming communities in, in Braidwood's terms. Yeah. 
Now, interestingly enough in Mexico, we have not found a stage of circular semi-subterranean houses. Uh, the first houses of which we have any evidence are already rectangular, as you can see from this post hole pattern uh, of one uh, dating to about uh, 1200 BC. And uh, in life, they looked uh, probably like this, uh, a whole series of posts and then a covering of cane with mud over it, the familiar wattle and daub of uh, uh, middle America with a thatched roof like that. And then uh, associated with each house, and here on this slide, the house is represented by a line of post holes connected by dotted lines over on the right, uh, a courtyard in which a lot of outdoor activity goes on, including the making of storage pits, uh, the burying of people, and so on. And this seems to be the basic residential pattern for the primary village farming community in this part of Mesoamerica. Uh, later on, as we move into what um, uh, Bob Braid would have called in the old world uh, the period of established village farming efficiency, we begin to get mud brick houses, not unlike the ones in the Near East. And here you see uh, my Zapotec Indian workman who by then had learned how to work with mud brick, working out one of these houses. Uh, and when my workman asked me where I had learned to work with mud brick houses, I told them uh, I learned from a fellow I knew only as Haji Abdullah, a Sudanese pickman who was Braidwood's foreman at Sarab and who had apparently been a foreman for the Oriental Institute uh, since 1925. I'm sure he'd be happy to know that the Zapotec Indians are now using his uh, pick technique. Okay. Now let us move farther south to the Andes of South America. This is an area where three very different environmental zones contributed to the richness and complexity of early agriculture. The first of these zones was the Amazon jungle and the tropical eastern slopes of the Andes, which is a zone that contains the wild ancestors of such plants as manioc, peanuts, guavas, coca, and lima beans. It's little known because of the poor preservation in the tropics. The second zone would be the high Andes mountains themselves, which have the wild ancestors of the potato, a cereal called quinoa, and then a series of root crops uh, known as oca, oyuco, and maswa. And then finally, there is the coastal desert, which is what you see uh, on this uh, uh, map. This zone does not have many of the wild ancestors of the early domesticates, but it is a desert of such aridity that the remarkable archaeological preservation in that zone has told us a lot about the origins of agriculture uh, there. Uh, it's simply the case that the best archaeological preservation is in the zone that is least likely to contain the wild ancestors of any of the domesticates. And uh, Lo and behold, the incipient uh, cultivators of this zone lived in uh, circular semi-subterranean houses. Now, this is an area where, once again, uh, Richard McNeish has been a major contributor to our knowledge of early domestication. This time, through a project uh, he ran between 1969 and 1972 in the basin of Ayacucho in the South Central Highlands. Ayacucho, uh, among other things, seems to have settled one of the major questions about early agriculture in Peru, namely whether maize was domesticated indigenously in Peru or whether it was introduced from Mexico. On the basis of the evidence we have so far, it would appear that the earliest radiocarbon dated maize in the Andes, um, dating to between 3000 and 2500 BC, appears to be that of a Teosinte-influenced race most related to the Mexican race known as Naltel and hence most likely introduced from Mexico. And this makes sense because uh, assuming Teosinte is the uh, ancestor of maize, wild Teosinte has never been found uh, in the Andes. It would thus seem that it took maize about 2,500 years to reach the Peruvian highlands once it had been domesticated at places like Coscatlan Cave uh, in uh, Mexico. And most recently, uh, a Peruvian archaeologist, Duccio Bonavilla, has found maize dating to uh, 2500 BC at a site called Los Gavilanes in the Warme Valley on the coast of Peru, stored 
interestingly enough, in underground granaries that look for all the world like the ones that Kate and Thompson found in the Fayum in the 1920s. And based on the same principle, that sand is an extraordinarily good uh, preservative for corn, one that keeps it dry enough so that it doesn't sprout uh, prematurely. Now, let's just look at one of McNeish's caves from his project in the Andes. Th this is the cave of uh, Haiwa Machai, located in the um, Ayacucho Mountains at an elevation of 11,500 feet above sea level. Um, the oldest archaeological plant remains from McNeish's projects are rind fragments of the bottle gourd uh, dating from 11,000 BC uh, levels, uh, not in this cave but in one other cave. Excavations at other caves in the area show that by 5600 BC they were cultivating common beans and lima beans and the evidence from this particular cave of Haiwa Machai uh, shows a seed of a plant called achiote, which is uh, used for uh, red pigment, uh, that one uh, also dating back to that period of um, about 5,000 or 6,000 BC. The dates in Peru are such that we have to conclude that agriculture began there at too early a date to have been stimulated by diffusion from Mesoamerica, although some plants, such as maize, uh, apparently were uh, introduced. Unfortunately, because of poor preservation, we know very little about this important plant, the potato, uh, which is one of Peru's major uh, botanical contributions to the world. Here you see uh, Peruvian highland Indians uh, squeezing the water out of uh, potatoes um, on the Altiplano. They are producing uh, uh, the world's, what were certainly the world's first freeze-dried potatoes. Another uh, question for the Andes relates to animal domestication because unlike Mesoamerica where domestic animals were not particularly important, the Andes had two extremely important camelids, um, the llama and the alpaca. Here you see a herd of, uh, of llamas at 13,500 feet in the Andes. Um, and uh, it is not known yet uh, exactly when they were domesticated. The person who has probably done the most on this is uh, a zoologist, uh, Elizabeth Wing of uh, Florida University, whose measurements have shown a size difference between the smaller uh, domestic llama and its larger wild ancestor, uh, the guanaco. Working uh, with McNeish's faunal samples, uh, which uh, Liz Wing and I were able to do uh, in the, uh, during the period of his Ayacucho project, we have attempted to prepare survivorship curves based on those which you saw from sites in Iran uh, using sheep and goats. Now, there is one major problem with the use of these survivorship curves in the Andes. The problem is that nowadays the yama is a beast of burden. It's used primarily uh, for transportation. And when the yama is used primarily for transportation, they don't kill the young ones. What they eat are the elderly ones that are too old to carry their uh, burdens anymore. And what that means is that a domestic herd has roughly the same age and sex profile as a wild Wanako herd, and the statistics don't mean much. Uh, but uh, there is some evidence to suggest that at the earliest stages of domestication, they were used more for food than, for, um, than as beasts of burden. These are just some of the uh, measurements uh, used by Elizabeth Wing um, to distinguish wild and domestic varieties, much uh, as in the case of the uh, uh, Near Eastern animals we looked at earlier. Now, a major contribution to the uh, history of the domestication of the Yama is being made by a Peruvian archaeologist, Ramiro Matos, who is digging at caves like these, 14,000 feet up in the Andes, uh, in, an, in uh, one of the areas where early domestication uh, of camelids probably took place. Working with fauna from one of his caves, uh, uh, Jane Wheeler, a former student of mine, now reports that around 4,000 BC, you do get a sudden rise in the percentage of animals eaten before one year of age, uh, which may indicate the beginnings of domestication of camelids uh, for food. Uh, 
and her approach is a direct outgrowth of the age and sex studies of early goat and sheep herds in the Zagros Mountains that were stimulated by the uh, Iraq Jarmo project. The final area uh, that I'm going to look at very briefly is the Pacific coast of Ecuador. This is the Guayas Basin, uh, south of Guayaquil. Uh, I simply want you to look at the two sites here, San Pablo and Real Alto, excavated under the direction of Donald Lathrop of the University of Illinois. Now, this is a tropical area which may is reached by about 3000 BC, but because it is tropical, preservation is an extreme problem, and I want to show you the solution that Lathrop uh, arrived at. What you see here is the impression of a corn kernel in a potsherd from the site of San Pablo. The same technique we saw uh, used in the potsherds at Jarmo, in the potsherds from Nok Nok Ta, and uh, in Thailand, uh, Lathrop finds that, pot, that um, uh, corn kernels get uh, included in potsherds of the period 2500 to 3000 BC. In fact, uh, the occupants of the site of Real Alto uh, made it even easier for the archaeologists because they decided to decorate their pottery by pushing corn kernels into it to make the indentations you see here in the middle specimen. And you can practically pour latex into those indentations and come out with a cast of corn kernels of that period. What were the houses at Real Alto like? You guessed it. They are circular, semi-subterranean structures. Okay, that's the last slide, so if I could have the lights back again, okay. Well, that's sort of a whirlwind tour of the world, looking at uh, people working on early food production, and uh, in the time I have, all, you can, all I can give you is a whirlwind tour. What I wanted to close with is this. As you walk through the new exhibit at the Oriental Institute, and look at the tangible results of that project that began 34 years ago in the mountains of Iraq, I want you to remember that its intellectual impact, its intellectual impact extended much farther than the Near East. At Spirit Cave in Thailand, at Koshgatlan Cave and the Gilan Akits rock shelter in Mexico, at Haiwa Machai Cave in Peru, at Wadi Kubania in the Nile Valley and at Real Alto on the Pacific coast of Ecuador, interdisciplinary teams are building on a research design that was originally established in Iraqi Kurdistan. The Jarmo project was one of those magic projects whose intellectual excitement seems to have affected even those people who were never there and probably even people who weren't born when the project started. So when you look at the sherds and the flints, and the seeds and the figurines. Try not to forget the artifact that made it all possible, the iron fist in the velvet glove. <laughs> you won't find it in the exhibit because I saw it today and it's still on the wrist of Robert J. Braidwood. Thank you. Well, that was a, a whirlwind tour, but a wonderful one, and I think a, a, a wonderful introduction for the time that uh, we hope you can spend this evening and in the days to come with the exhibit that will, will open, or that in fact already has opened in the gallery immediately next door to us. Rather than take time for questions and discussions at this point, I'm sure you may have some, and I do hope that you <coughs> will take up your points with Kent in the reception to follow. I do want to pick up one theme that, that uh, uh, Kent has touched on at points during his talk. Uh, we have with us tonight many individuals who have shared with Bob and Linda uh, work in the field over a period of many years. And he mentioned a number of names. I don't know that I can uh, remember them all as I stand here, but uh, this is, on the occasion of the opening of this exhibit, a a rare occasion <coughs> also for us in that, that uh, people have come together who in many cases uh, haven't seen one another uh, since field work uh, at Jarmo or uh, with the Braidwoods in Iran uh, over a very long time. Reference was made to Jack Harlan, who's up here tonight from the 
the University of Illinois in the field of agronomy, to Frank Hole, who's here from Yale, uh, who's gone on with studies in prehistory. Uh, Vivian Morales is here. I worked with her at Jarmo in 1950. She's up here tonight from, from Guatemala. Uh, Charlie Reed from the Circle Campus of the University of Illinois, whose uh, figure you saw uh, cutting the flesh from that old pig. Um, uh, Herb Wright, down from the University of Minnesota, the uh, geologist for many years, with the first with the Iraq Jarmo project, and then in a whole series of other uh, later expeditions as well. But I want to go on to say that in addition to this gathering of uh, old field hands on Braidwood projects, we're also privileged to have with us uh, a number of distinguished colleagues who came simply to greet the Braidwoods on the occasion of the opening of this exhibit. Uh, we have with us from Paris, Genevieve Dolphus and Jean Perrault. We have Hans Nissen from Berlin. Uh, we have Kyler Young from Toronto and Phil Smith from Montreal. Uh, we have Andrew Moore from the University of Arizona. And I don't know, I'm probably missing some more names, but it's uh, uh, Henry Wright from the University of Michigan. I'm, I'm probably still missing some. It's uh, for us a, uh, a splendid occasion and a, a sort of gathering of archaeological clans of a very unusual kind. And if any of you are going to be